If there's anyone else who has an announcement, just let me know in the chat uh, and we can give you some time as well. All right, so as usual, we're having our post-seminar hangout today and our hangout today after seminar is going to be a faculty spotlight. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Yanchar who's going to be just uh, uh, letting us know a little bit about him and his research interests and uh, what his hobbies are. So yeah, uh, please stick around after seminar today if you'd like to get to know Dr. Yanchar and uh, yeah, there'll also be a Q&A. So yeah, feel free to stick around and get to know him a little bit better and we'll see you there. All right, are there any other announcements or issues to bring up to the group? Please remember just the other seminar assignments, talking to a student about a project, attending a defense. You've seen a few defenses come through and obviously there will be more coming, so make sure that you plan for those to be part of your schedule as well. If there aren't any other issues, then let me turn the balance of our time over to Enoch Hunsaker. Enoch is a graduate of our program in the last few years. I did a great uh, master's project and we got a lot of experience uh, through our design classes, instructional design classes, and since has begun a career at BYU Online as an instructional designer there. In fact, a part of his portfolio is the instructional design or course, the courses for our department. So he's the instructional designer for, for us and the things that we offer through BYU Online and will continue to offer as we uh, make some advances here in the next year or so. Uh, we're grateful to have Enoch with us and to share some things he's learned and uh, give us some wisdom here uh, over the next 45 minutes or so. So if you'll join me in welcoming Enoch to an RP, our IPNT seminar today, Enoch will turn the balance of the time over to you. Awesome, thank you, Jason. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Can I just get a thumbs up that you can hear me? Okay, great. And then I'm gonna share my screen. So if I can just... Uh, you just give me another thumbs up if you can see my screen, that would be great. Awesome. All right, I'm just adjusting so I can see you all as well. One second for that. All right, well, um, as, as Jason mentioned, I am um, an instructional designer at BYU Online. I did graduate from my PNT program uh, just a few years ago, back in 2018. Um, I made this picture of my kids the biggest because that's what everyone really wants to look at. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got five kids. They are uh, the oldest one, seven, and and then they go all the way down to this one who's just a month old. So that's me in a nutshell. And um, I wanted to, you know, today we're going to be talking about um, instructional design, and I'm going to take you through an instructional design process, hopefully in a pretty quick fashion. Um, and the reason I chose this topic, I actually, um, I've worked with several IPNT students in the course of my time at, at uh, BYU Online. A lot, of, a lot of you come up and are instructional design assistants for us, and that's been a fantastic partnership with you. Um, but I, I asked some of those students kind of what were some things that they took out of their experience um, at BYU Online that they thought were valuable and that might be helpful for other um, IPNT students to know and understand. Um, and so some of the things that came up, obviously there were, there were a lot of things as, as people responded to me, but um, what I wanted to kind of show you guys a little bit today is just kind of the complexity and messiness of the process of creation. These are some phrases from um, from those students. How, how much work it is to maintain or update a course. Um, the ideal is usually not what we have time to do, not usually what ends up happening. Um, some nuances of communicating with an instructional design client, in this case a, a faculty member or a, a course author. Um, what an instructional designer's day looks like, and um, working with stakeholders like SNEs, um, things like the way we standardize our courses, um, how to communicate again on the professor's level. So those are just some ideas that came out of, out of that information. And that's what I'm gonna try and present to you today um, and hopefully do it in a fun way that will kind of help you to experience um, a design process, at least from a BYU online flavor. Um, rather than just having me talk for a long time. So anyway, um, I, the, the format of today's um, learning experience is going to kind of be a, 
the story of a course. So we're going to go through kind of five, I'm going to highlight five plot points here represented by these, um, these dots on the screen that you'll see. We're going to have three breakouts. Um, so you're going to be in groups of, I think, three to four, maybe five people um, that are going to do some tasks, um, some design tasks based on this, the spot in the story that you're at. And then, um, and then we're going to have a couple of discussions. So not, we're not going to do a, a breakout on every single one of these points. We will do a couple of discussions instead. Um, but I just encourage you as, um, as you're going through this experience, I know some of you are design emphasis and some of you are not, but um, as you go through, just kind of look for, um, look for the gold nuggets of what you can glean from this. I, I recognize that most of you will not work at BYU Online, but, but I think there's still something to be um, gleaned from kind of seeing a, a design process in this compressed format and experiencing that for yourselves. So anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you want to just open this up in, if you've got a second screen or um, a computer, uh, just a, a different window on your computer or even a mobile device, I'd love for you to just have this open. Um, because there's going to be some links in this slideshow that will take you out to some documents that you'll need in your breakout groups. Can you link the slideshow in the chat? Yeah, that's, I'll do that right now. Um, if I can find the controls here. Chat, there we go. And I'll make sure this gets to everyone. Okay, there is the link to the slideshow. I'll just go ahead and open that up. Um, and then we're going to jump into our, our first breakout here in just a minute. Um, so the first breakout, um, here's the, the story of this, is that a new course has just been approved for um, the higher ed online program that you're working in. And um, you've been assigned as the instructional designer team for this course. And um, you need to meet with that course author. So what you're going to see um, for, for each of these kickoff, for each of these breakout rooms, you're going to see kind of the story here, and then you're going to see a stimulus. So you'll see kind of that, what you're going to see this time is the course approval form. Um, and then you're going to take a look at that, and then you're going to create a kickoff meeting agenda. So just you kind of create some bullet points. It doesn't have to be super super detailed in any one of these because there's not going to be enough time to go into that but um, just create a kind of a quick agenda note kind of any specific follow-up questions you might want to ask if you're given this task of okay we're going to design a an online course um, in this topic what are you going to ask so what you're going to do this time um, is kind of three things, well, four things, I guess. So you're gonna choose a track, you're gonna choose either math or I should say psych here, not humanities. Um, and then you're gonna choose a lead for your team and that they will kind of be the lead for each of those um, kickout or breakout sessions. And then just in the chat, just drop me a message either to everyone or just to me um, and just kind of say who, the, the first name of the team lead and then which track you're taking, so I might say, Jared Math or Amy Psych, right? And then, um, and then you're gonna create a kickoff meeting agenda, and just kind of you know figure out what you want to do. And then you can use these links. These will link out to um, a, a real course approval form. It's been redacted a bit, um, but but you should be able to see some information on there that will help you. So. We'll go ahead into that breakout, but I want to see if there's any questions on, on the breakout before I, I split you. Any questions or confusion? All right, so Jason, if we could go ahead and, and start the breakout, let's give them four minutes. In four minutes, you'll automatically be brought back into the big group, um, and um, we will go from there. Awesome, thanks for sending those in. Um, sometimes we'll have a chance to kind of share what we talked about, but in this case, um, I'm gonna skip that step and I'm just gonna show you 
um, what we typically use as a couple of resources that we might typically use in a kickoff meeting at BYU Online. So let me share my screen again here. All right, so you should see um, the kickoff meeting uh, agenda here. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger for you. Maybe, there we go. Um, but you can kind of see, here's, here's a template that a lot of our designers use kind of talk about, um, you know, a high level vision for the course. We talk about roles and expectations for the design process. Um, we discuss resources that we provide as an organization, set some milestones, um, and then clarify next steps to be taken. I heard a lot of other great ideas, um, you know, depending on kind of your individual flavors and as a designer or what, you know, questions that you have based on what you saw in the course approval form, you might be, um, you might be have, adding some additional types of things to a kickoff meeting as well. But, but at least for BYU Online, the kickoff meeting is kind of that first, that first encounter with the faculty. And we really want to um, have an experience where um, they get excited about designing a BYU Online course and they know what to expect um, from, from the experience. So um, let's go ahead and go back to the story here. So, um, so in this case, you know, you've had the kickoff meeting, um, and, but then you find out that maybe the course author or some other people in the department are kind of resistant to the idea of online education. Uh, maybe they think, oh, you know what, we, we really can't teach this topic online. Um, and, and to kind of um, address that issue, you now need to come up with some cool ideas to show your faculty what might be possible with their subject. So again, I'm gonna have you go into a breakout room. Let's do four minutes again. And Jason, if you'll just kind of vary which room you put me in so I can get a chance to see all the different groups, that would be fantastic. And um, you'll go with that same track that you were in before, either math or psych. And you're just gonna create some kind of a quick sketch of a learning object you wanna showcase. So pick one person to do the sketch. I'll pick a couple teams at random to kind of show your sketch. Um, and then I'll show you some ideas of what we do to, to maybe show faculty what's possible when maybe we have a resistance situation. So we'll go ahead back into the same breakout groups, um, except for me in a different room, uh, four minutes on the clock. Hey, Enoch, can we get some by a sketch? Um, <clears throat> you know what, it could be a sketch or it could even just be like a few bullet points, right? Like maybe you're sketching out a, an ob a learning object that you want them to create, you want to create for their course, or maybe you're just, um, you're mocking up a, a few ideas of how a discussion would look in their course, right? Just some, get something down on paper of like a great idea for online learning that they could use in this math or this psych course. Does that, does that help? Yeah, that helps a little bit. Are we, are we assuming asynchronous or synchronous? Or does it matter? Um, we have both in the program. We have synchronous experiences and asynchronous, so you could do either one. Okay. It says to pick a, a learning objective. Do we have the list of the, the learning objectives somewhere? Um, is is oh, it a learning object? I, I, yeah, a learning object. So any, what I mean by that is just any assignment or informational piece, right? You could, you could mock up a, a you know, a, an interactive learning experience. It could be a, uh, like, like a discussion board. It could be just a regular assignment. It could be, um, you know, and. Oh, an, that's what you mean by object. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. Any other clarifying questions you want to ask before we break out? And you just want us to put this in the chat or somewhere else? Um, if you want to put it in the chat, that's great. Or you can just write it down on a piece of paper, wherever you want to put it is fine with me. All right, let's go ahead and start the breakout. Oh, 
Sorry, I was on mute there. I think we're mostly back. Um, I'm gonna just have a couple teams share a little bit of what they did. So what you'll do is you'll just take one minute um, each, and I'm gonna tell you who you are in a couple, in a minute here. Um, you'll take one minute and kind of, you can share your screen or you can just talk through what you wanna do, but just kind of paint the picture, pretend that you're just presenting to a faculty member um, your course author, your, your SME, whoever, whoever this is for you, and um, kind of show, right, what, what could be possible in this online learning environment. So the people I want, I want um, Abby's team with math, and, um, and then I want Jessica's team for psych. So it's just one minute, pitch this idea of what you could do in this online learning environment. So Abby, you go first. If you'll just come off mute and tell us what your team talked about. So the things that my team talked about highlighting were, um, first we'd want to show them a page with a whole bunch of different interactions and kind of show them what's possible for content pages, um, letting them see that like students can get automatic feedback exactly when they want it when they work through practice problems. And then the other thing that we'd want to highlight is the test banks and show what's possible there with like the several different versions of one question that you can get and randomizing it so that practice tests you can take several times always getting something else and actual assessments are much more difficult to cheat on because you have all of that variability. Yeah, awesome. Highlighting some, some unique features that you can have in, in, in a learning management system. That's great. Um, thank you, Abby. Okay, Jessica, uh, your team on psych, what did you guys talk about? Yeah, so uh, Rachel actually came up with a super awesome idea because we were looking at psych and she was talking about the experiments um, and how instead of just like learning about them that maybe we can have some interactive almost game like experience for the students that they can like walk through these experiments that are super important to the psych world. So it's something that is not just replacing lectures or whatever, but it's like transforming the student learner experience. And so we thought that would be kind of cool to show them that you don't just have to watch lectures online. You can really, students can interact with the content and learn in cool different ways. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Just having like really, really capitalizing on the unique features available in an online learning environment and not just trying to you know, copy something straight over in a way that doesn't quite work, but, but really adapting it to the online um, experience. Jessica, by the way, works with me. She's one of my colleagues at BYU Online, um, so I had to pick on her a little bit. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and go to the next story item. Um, um, oh yeah, so and just just briefly, uh, uh, what we do at BYU Online, we do have like generally a designer will develop kind of a demo course that shows some courses in their portfolio and show like, you know, here's some different ideas of things students have done in the past or if there's a really, you know, specific, you know, if a teacher has a really favorite thing they like to do, like figure out how to flip that into an online mode and demonstrate that. We found that like they really need to see it in order to get on board. That's, that's the number one thing that really helps people. All right, so then um, let's say that, yeah, you've got your faculty on board now, but they are just busy, right? So they've got research projects, they're preparing for an upcoming conference and they're grading a big paper. And so they just don't have a lot of time and they didn't meet that, um, that first milestone that you had set up in the kickoff meeting for getting their outline done. So uh, we're not gonna break out on this one, but I just wanna ask, you know, kind of pose this question. Um, how do you think you would respond to that situation? What, what would be some good strategies for approaching a non-responsive subject matter expert? I know this, this probably only happens ever at BYU Online, um, but, what what would you do? How would you approach that situation? Um, you know, are the subject matter experts external to the university? Um, in our case, they are internal, um, but they're also they're kind of external to BYU Online. So we don't really have a lot of direct 
um, supervisory control over them, right? So, so in, in some ways, it's kind of like working with an external C. But good question. Thoughts? How would you approach it? What would you say? Well, one, one thought that I that I have that um, has been helpful uh, for me is to do some initial development, um, just to kind of get something on paper or in some kind of form that they can respond to. Uh, because I think that sometimes, um, at least that upfront, you know, they may not be quite sure of what is really expected or what we what we're wanting from them. And so, you know, by by giving them something to respond to, then that can maybe engage them a little bit. Yeah, that's an, that's a fantastic strategy I've, I've definitely used that a lot um, of just okay you don't have an outline done well okay I'm gonna look through something that you've given me maybe they've given me access to another course you know their course on learning suite or something or a syllabus or something and I'll just fill in what I can on that outline and then send it over and say okay what did I get wrong right or or I'll start writing a lesson even like hey, here's what I came up with. Is that what you want? And they'll say, no, 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 This is what I want, right? So yeah, that's a great way is just getting them started, giving, giving that over that activation energy hump, right? Okay, what else? What other thoughts do you have on dealing with this situation? I also think that it's probably helpful in your initial conversation with them just to try and set some expectations of, hey, so this is how I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need you to be providing content and et cetera, et cetera. So Hopefully they're not surprised when you're like, hey, I need a little bit more from you because you've already set that expectation with them. Yeah, absolutely. That comes back to that kickoff meeting and really setting some really great expectations from the front. I think some of it too might just be follow-up. Like sometimes I know the faculty are usually willing to do and help. It's just a matter of following up and like, you know, I'm sure they'll get to it as soon as at some point, if we follow up enough, right? Yeah. Following up is good. Michelle? Um, sometimes when you approach it from an area of concern, it mm. gets a different reaction. Like, I haven't heard from you. Are you okay? Um, because one, they might not be okay. But two, um, when if, if they have just dropped the ball, from my experience, when I've dropped the ball and someone approaches me like, are you okay? I haven't heard from you. I feel way worse than just like, hey, how come you haven't done that? And then I, <laughs> I jump on it. Yeah. Not totally that my motivation right. is to make them feel bad, but um, primarily to make sure they're okay, but also to get the, get, get the process going. Yeah, awesome. Um, there were a couple of, Great comments in the chat. Um, Charles said, loose faculty can be really challenging clients to work with. Um, so, and, and this is not like, this is not unique to higher education. I think SMEs in every area can can be, you know, they, they have busy lives and this often isn't their their primary function, right? This isn't their, their only thing that they're doing. And so, you know, I agree, just approaching it from a place of empathy, approaching it from, from a place of how can I help you know, even approaching it from, hey, here's here's what I could come up with. Help me fill this out, right? Help me finish this up. Uh, I think can be really, really good strategies to approach. Um, awesome. Let's go ahead and move to the next thing. So we're into the development phase a little bit. We've got the outline done. We're doing some stuff. Um, we're, we're creating some videos in this case and um, the faculty member says, hey, I want to make a video. Here's my slides for this video. And, and they send them to us and we think, okay, there's a few things that need to be done here. So I want you to put on your design hats, but also like your copyright hats and your web accessibility hats if you have that hat yet. Um, you, you may not, but just think about, okay, how, how, might the, how might a blind person approach this video or how might a you know, a deaf person interact with this content? Or how does this, you know, how could we tweak the design of this slide to be a little bit better? So if you'll, um, what you're gonna do in this breakout is just open up this problematic slide. And then um, it's, it's in Google Doc and you should have access to comment. 
But if you'll just go ahead and, and throw a comment in there on like some things that you think should be done to this slide to make it better for what we're using it for, which is they're going to record a video with, with slides, right? So they're kind of they're creating this mini lecture and they have this slides on the side. They're going to be a talking head, but there's also going to be this slide here. I only gave you one slide because we don't have time to look through a whole deck, but um, let's give three minutes on the clock back in those same breakout groups and just take a look at this and um, see what kinds of things you think we need to do. Any questions before we break out? Awesome. All right, thanks for going through that exercise real quick. I'm gonna pick on um, Melissa's group and um, maybe just one group for this time. But Melissa, why don't you walk us through a couple of things that you noticed um, on the slide? I'm gonna share this. There's, there's two Melissa's. I assume you mean me, but- I do mean good. you, okay. yeah. Um, so we talked about a couple of things, this text, doesn't have a lot of spacing, so it's a little bit difficult to read. It might even be good to separate it into two slides. Um, the image of the car isn't, there's not really a source. It just says it's from Getty, but we don't know if we have permission to show it um, in an online format for a class. And is the picture of the car really necessary? Is it just decorative? It needs to be labeled for a screen reader, someone who's blind who couldn't see it. Um, we talked about how the table's problematic, that the um, it's an image of a table rather than an actual table. So it would need to be separated out and created a new table that's navigable by a screen reader with headings and everything. And then each of the images below need to be, have a description along with them so that someone who can't see those would be able to understand what's going on in the picture. Yeah, awesome. I saw some really great comments about, you know, maybe even breaking up some of the information on this slide. It's just too much for one piece. Um, yeah, definitely that, that copyright and accessibility stuff. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So what I wanted to just kind of demonstrate here is just some of the types of things that you might need to be thinking about during the course development process. Um, and this is just obviously one of many kinds of things that you might be looking at, but it's a good, it's a good um, start. Okay, can you see my, my main slide deck again? Okay, awesome. Okay, so this last one, I'm just gonna actually do a little bit of show and tell. So we're done with the course, it's all developed, the videos are in, we fill our copyright and accessibility boxes. We just need to make sure we know how the course is going. So I wanted to show you a couple things that BYU Online does um, to, gather some data and use that data to make some decisions. So one thing is um, the pilot survey. So if you make sure, um, what we have each week, we have a pilot survey that we ask the students to uh, answer and they go in here and they just put in their course name and then they answer some questions about um about how their experience is going and it's really simple right like what week are you evaluating and then you know where did you get stuck what did you find most useful and how many hours did you spend this week All right and then we take that data and we also have a mid course and end of course survey and so one of the other pieces um that we have, um, we take, we have this pilot tracker and some of you who've worked for me are very familiar with this, but essentially we take that and we kind of do some coding, right? Some, um, some oh, I forget the word now, but, but basically we're, we're taking those comments and breaking them down into how many times are we getting this comment and, and we can kind of isolate where students are having the most trouble and what they're having the most trouble with and then we can use that to make changes 
to the course content. And then we also have some pretty nifty dashboards um, and feedback from the pilot survey as well as the mid and end of course surveys as well as other um, data sources on campus feed into this so we can kind of get, you know, what's a demographic profile for this course? What does the academic profile look like for a course? Um, and then we can even go down and we can look at, uh, you know, the, the specific survey data that we've gotten, you know, how, how high is this course ranking on a scale of one to five in this particular area. So it's pretty cool. We've got some, some good data, but, um, you know, making decisions based on this, this data from students as well as obviously whatever the faculty is thinking is, is really a key part of, of the course design process. So that concludes kind of our story. Um, I wanted you to just have a chance in the last five minutes we have to either share any gold nuggets, anything cool that you learned or, or unique or um, surprising, or to just ask questions, you know, about, about what we saw today, anything you want to ask about BYU Online or, or my experience, um, go ahead and, and throw those out there. You can either chat them in or go ahead and unmute and either share a gold nugget or ask a question. How many hours does it take to create a typical course? What's typical? Um, it, it really varies widely um, because we've got a, a wide variety of, of faculty who of you know, how much work they want to do versus how much work they want us to do. We've got a variety of how much media we're going to put into a course. So, you know, some courses really low time from us and some courses are a lot. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know. Yeah, it, it really just depends um, how many hours it takes. How many courses do I work on? I've, um, I think each designer in BYU Online has a portfolio of about 20 courses. And we have, um, some of those are just in a maintenance state. So at any given time, um, we probably work, we, we aim to work on maybe two to three active courses at a time in development, maybe two to three in pilot. Um, there are some semesters and some designers that do significantly more than that sometimes. But, but yeah. Um, is it a priority to use OER? Um, we definitely have a priority to try and lower student cost. And so where OER will help with that, then yes, but ultimately it's up to the faculty. Um, in a lot of ways, we're a service provider for the faculty. So if you know, it, we suggest that, we try and help them find resources sometimes, but um, it's, it's up to the faculty whether they, they use OER or not. As far as like images and stuff, yeah, we definitely try and, and find Creative Commons sources for as much as we can. Um, so we don't have to go through a fair use process. Um, percentage of professors new to online. Erin, do you know the answer to that question? Well, it's becoming less and less after this year. Um, last semester out of maybe 300, teachers, well, 300 sections, so probably a little less, only 30 of them were new to online for us. Um, now, I don't know if it, nobody, any, anybody would be able to say they're new to online now. But a year ago, that number was probably at least 50% were new to online. Mm -hmm. uh, how frequently do courses get revised? Um, depends, probably every three years or so is kind of the idea. In BYU Online, courses kind of get constantly revised in a lot of ways because it's just a little bit different model. And, you know, with independent study, there's kind of like a, a cycle that they'll go through and say, okay, you know, you need to revise this course, but it's a different model. With BYU Online, those courses are constantly running. They're usually being taught by someone who developed the course. And so often we're constantly getting changes sent in um, for those courses. Um, online differentiated from emergency remote teaching. Yeah, so the online experience is intended to be, right, very intentional design, right? The, when, when everyone hit COVID and started doing remote teaching, it was kind of just, okay, we're doing what we did before, but just online or 
you know, we're throwing something together really quick. So I think that's the biggest difference is just kind of a process of intentional design um, between those two. Um, and then certain subjects more difficult to bring to an online medium. Yeah, probably. I think, I think any subject um, could be taught online in some way. Um, definitely there, there are bigger challenges than others, right? Um, I, I don't know about subject areas, but, but definitely learning ob objectives. Some are more difficult to handle online. Um, and some are more, you know, some, some just lend themselves better, right? If, if I'm a doctor and the learning objective is to perform a surgery or something, there's definitely online ways to, you know, do, there's virtual stuff that happens, but at some point, like, there has to be, a, you know, a literal, uh, you know, some, some actual hands-on types of things. And those can be difficult, but, but, you know, there's ways to work around that as well. Um, <clears throat> yes, physical education might be a bit harder, um, depending on what you're wanting to do, right? Like, you can, um, you know, assessing, assessing that could be a bit harder, but, but there are ways you can, you can send in videos for performance assessments. Um, and the, it might be hard to see, you know, like, are they doing all these forms, these exercises perfectly right? So, so yeah, there are some difficulties, but, but as the technology gets better and better, it's easier to overcome those things. Um, we're kind of at our time. I can totally continue to address these questions. If people want to stick around, I'm happy to continue answering questions, but I want to be respectful of your time as well. So if you need to um, tap out, then thanks for coming. Um, it was great to see you. Um, but yeah, if you want to stick around, I'll go ahead and, and address the rest of these questions. Um, all right, well, let's just quickly, for those who are leaving, let's thank Enoch for his time and preparation for our seminar today. We're very grateful for his effort and appreciate his friendship to our department. Uh, we do have this seminar after party. Um, I'll turn the, the toasting over to Maku, and Maku can create a breakout room for anyone who'd like to stick around and talk to Enoch as well. Otherwise, you're excused, and we will see you next week for another seminar.